I had him doing a lot of the initial prototyping on Spore. And he turned out to be great at prototyping in a very toy-like aesthetic sense. And so uh, I've been assigning kind of stereotypes to each of these people. <laughs> and by the way, they hate these stereotypes. <laughs> so feel free to tease them about it later. Uh, next was Jenna Chalmers, who'd worked on a lot of The Sims games with me, Sims Online, et cetera. And uh, I decided to put her in charge of the space game, which really is the most epic part of the game, the most open-ended part of Spore. And uh, you'll see later on that uh, the way she approaches things, she has these very elaborate plans with all these millions of moving little parts that intricately fit together just right. And so she's the mastermind on the team. And uh, Alex Hutchinson, last one here that we brought on the team, and uh, he's kind of the cowboy in the group. Uh, I hate my nickname. Yeah, he loves this, by the way. Uh, and this is no reflection on his documentation skills. <laughs> but, uh, the way he approaches design is very much, you know, more intuitive, off the cuff, you know, going around getting consensus. But, uh, and he's right now working on the core levels, really, you know, the deep gameplay that the player is experiencing. And we actually have another designer who just recently retired from the team, who's not here, Chris Trotier. And she, her role was really more of architect, kind of making all these different visions work together on the same design, bringing all these things in unification. So, and my role as lead designer really is more traffic cop than anything else. You know, I have all these people coming with ideas. They have to be resolved. We have to come to consensus. We have to make the thing feel like a unified experience to the player, which is really hard when you're mixing all these genres. Now, starting with Ocean, you know, one of the central problems that I think, you know, the uh, art director on this project faces is the fact that in gameplay, you really want a certain amount of abstraction. The player wants to kind of understand what the units are, what the relevant kind of borders, boundaries are. But yet, at the same time, you want something that looks beautiful up on screen. And the players are making a lot of these things that you know, have functional meaning. You have to be able to look at this and say, what is its function? But at the same time, you want to blend in very smoothly in the world. So uh, I'm going to kind of pass the mic over to Ocean and go through some of his early process. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so um, let's see. This, this uh, project is unlike any other project I've ever worked on before. Uh, and in all the previous games, uh, I have a team of artists. They're competent. They make the stuff we tell them to make, we put it in the game, and we're done. I mean, maybe some programmers have to do some stuff. Um, and uh, in this game, <laughs> by contrast, um, we basically have to make the parts that let the players make stuff, um, and we have to put together the systems that um, give them the illusion of competence. Um, and so uh, what we're looking at here are, uh, first, first, we had to give some sense of what uh, of what we wanted, the kind of range, the breadth of creatures that we wanted to have in the game are. So these are some examples of, we got a concept artist, we said make a bunch of crazy alien creatures, and then we have to deconstruct those creatures into parts. Because the player is not dealing with the entire creature, they're dealing with the little parts of creatures that they snap together in various ways. Um, so here you're taking a look at all these different parts, uh, we have to figure out a way to put those parts together into kind of coherent creatures and do all the things that, um, that, you, would, um, that you would do with the creature. And then, um, uh, to speak to the, uh, the illusion of competence uh, issue, um, we've got uh, um, a problem in that content in games is really good now. I mean, if you look at the, the kind of the state-of-the-art characters with state-of-the-art animation, they're, they're really good. I mean, the, the texturing is beautiful, uh, the animation's rich. Um, we have to give something that's cleanly stylized, that looks sweet, um, but, that, uh, but that doesn't require um, basically a player to be... Uh, a rigger, a modeler, a texture artist, a UV painter, um, an animator. Um, and so uh, that basically drove some of the stylistic, stylistic decisions we made. That uh, previous shot that Will showed just a second ago um, was uh, part of a, an early problem that we had. We were trying to figure out, do we want to make this game realistic? Do we want to make it look like, um, uh, science book. Look like a science book? Do we want to make it look like you're seeing plausible illustrations of real aliens? And, um, and fundamentally, that just turned out to be too hard. Um, well, it, also, yeah. it also ended up animating really badly. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. If you had so, someone who made a dog, and it really did look like a dog, but didn't move like a dog, then the illusion yeah. of competence it, was... It, like, it would make children cry. Yes. I think um, this was kind of an early split on the team, too. <laughs> we basically had the team split up into the cute team and the science team. So and I think Ocean and I were kind of on the science team. Yeah, I've been dragged, kicking and screaming <laughs> over to, like, let's make things cute to conceal our flaws. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> I mean, everyone wants, no, I mean, no one's going to say no to big eyes. If you put big eyes on something, everybody's going to love it. So, yeah, we, should, we proved out focus tests. <laughs> it's amazing. You put big eyes and they blink yeah. and all the 